right, good evening. So if you are going to children's ministry, Kathleen is in the back, so you can join her. We also have uh, junior high, high school upstairs, if you want. So a few quick announcements briefly. Thank you for your giving. We appreciate that. You can give online. You can give through our app. You can give by mail. You can give in the back. Uh, all kinds of ways to give. Keep this ministry going. We had uh, a good first service this morning at the park. Very, very nice. <clears throat> and so speaking of that, let me announce uh, AM service only coming up. June 20th, next week, Father's Day, AM service only. July 4th, AM service only with a barbecue afterwards. Show up. We'll provide the food. July 11th, AM service only, and August 1st. So I've got four coming up, AM services only. We'd love to have you. Um, one of those will be a barbecue, and the church will provide the food. So we're looking forward to that. <clears throat> no lunch club this Thursday, but each of the lunch clubs has been cool. Um, somebody different has come, and it's been great. If it's cold at all, let me warn you about the lunch club, if it's cold at all, if there's the slightest breeze, if there's really anything wrong outdoors at all, I'll be inside Chipotle. Just, just a heads up. And so there was just the slightest cool breeze and I disappeared. So <laughs> uh, I'd love to have you though. It would be great to see you. And then coming up, Adults Night Out. Wednesday, June 23rd, 6.30 to 9 at the Eddy. Uh, you can bring your dogs, grab some food. We'll be hanging out at the Eddy. It'll be a great time. So we would love to see you then. Uh, brief announcement also, we continue to need your prayers to find a place to meet where we can all meet together inside of a building with a bathroom and air conditioning and heat. I mean, we're not asking for a whole lot. The elders, uh, we had kind of five real good opportunities and three of those have told us to pound sand. So, uh, our top three. So, uh, I guess... You don't have to lease to a church. And each of those had said, you're a church, we will not lease to you. I have this sneaking suspicion if we were selling all kinds of other things, we would have had that any one of those buildings. But we're selling Jesus, and he's not super popular. So if you would continue to pray, all we do not want to like go into a place where nobody wants us and we're an eyesore. We want to be a blessing. We want to bless others around us. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm in a season of life right now where this totally makes sense because every single door around me is closing and, and like one after another after another. And I just see in front of me just closed doors. And it's in those moments that God is just saying, be patient and wait. And I have something more for you. So sometimes in life, that's the position we're in, closed doors. And it's our job to be patient, to pray, to be faithful, to be obedient to the will of God during those times. So uh, we are actually taking a break this evening from our First Peter sermon series. Uh, we're actually going to be in Luke chapter 19 this morning. So if you want to turn to Luke chapter 19, once a year at least, I try to take a moment and talk about evangelism. And, uh, and what is evangelism? What are we trying to do? So evangelism is a big, scary word for telling other people about Jesus. One of the things I need to remember during this last season of COVID, during COVID, the last year and a half, it's been really easy for me to just turn really inward. Um, my problems, my issues, my church, my family, my things, and it's really easy when things are hard to turn inward and worry about yourself. That's okay. We can worry about ourselves. We can take care of ourselves. We can ask God to work. But as Christians, we have to remember that primarily we are still outward focused. There's still a lost world. There's still people who need Jesus. There's still people who are dying and going to spend an eternity somewhere. And so no matter how hard life gets, and Christians for 2,000 years have proven this, uh, Christians under persecution, uh, Christians being martyred, Christians having tough times, and they were still outwardly focused. And so we get that outward focus from Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are supposed to be outward focused, even though it's easy to become inward focused. So at Mountainside, we say it this way. The most important thing is people finding Jesus. And I want to leave that up here for a moment. And now I want to tell you a story. So uh, this happened to me. It was right before COVID. I was supposed to do a sermon series right before the government shut our church down and right before DePoli booted us out. I was going to do a sermon series on evangelism because of this one incident that happened to me. And so I had it all planned out, and I had thought it all through, and then it just disappeared. So about two or three weeks before COVID and all of that, I can be found at Flex Appeal every Monday through Friday, every morning from 6.45 a.m. until about 8.30. You can find me there. I will show up, and I will drink my water, and I will lift, and then I will walk on a treadmill. So one of these mornings, I was tired. I had my... It's, and I don't get a lot of me time. So it's, that's like me time. You all need me time. That's mine at the gym. I can just think and pray and have thoughts. And, and it's great because the kids are at school and, and they're, they've moved along. And so I'm sitting here and I'm walking and I have a, something playing. And I'm, I'm just tired and I have my headset on and I'm watching a movie and I'm just walking on this stupid treadmill. And so I'm sitting there. <clears throat> and have you ever had a moment where you know someone is just staring right at you? Like you're at a restaurant or you're out and, you're, and you don't want to look, but you're like, I feel like someone's staring at me. And I feel like they're, and I feel really weird right now. And so I'm sitting there on the treadmill and I'm like, I have a, I have a very bad feeling. And I turn, and there's a man right here. And he's staring at me. So I've been focused this way, and he's about, he's about here. And I turn, and I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be disturbed. Either walk on your treadmill or get off and leave me alone. I don't, I'm not here for interaction at this moment. So I press pause, I pause, and then I am walking, I'm like, hi, and I mean, he is right here. And it was startling just to see someone right there. Hi, how are you? And he says, hi, my name is blah, 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 and I'm one of the new trainers here, and I'd like to offer my help. And I'm like, well, you know, I just kind of, and he says, what are your fitness goals? What are you kind of all about? <laughs> I barely share that with my wife, <laughs> let alone a dude standing right here. And so now I go to the side deals because I'm about to fall. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm good. Kind of show up. And I'm kind of new to being like making this a routine in my life, but I'm doing that. And I'm just kind of here and, and yeah, I, I lift and I do. That. Okay, well, well, if you need some help, you know, I'm here and you can always hire me and I'm an instructor and I'm blah, blah, blah. And I would love to help you in your goals as well and blah, blah, blah. And cool. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I'm back on. All right. That starts my mind as a pastor thinking about an evangelism sermon series. Because I learned five things when he and I interacted. Number one, clearly this man was totally unimpressed with the gains that I had achieved at that gym. <laughs> if you are at a gym and an instructor walks right up to you and says, you are a mess. I would love to help you with what you got going on here because you ain't, you ain't doing much. So number one, he was clearly unimpressed, and I was a disaster to be fixed. Two, he isn't wrong for helping me or selling me anything. That's not wrong. Three, that particular day, I was very much just in my lane and really, really didn't want to talk to anybody. Four, 
because of the bad timing, it came off highly annoying. And five, I think that's how evangelism works across America. Except I'm the instructor and non people who need Jesus were me. Like I get this really, really deep sense that I'm like people who need Jesus are just kind of in a lane walking, and I'm standing right here, like, you should try Jesus. Clearly, your life is, is a disaster. Clearly, the gains that you wanted, you're not seeing. I have a much better way, and I'd like to tell you about him. Like, can you, can you picture this? Because for me, it's like Christians, we're trying to help people, and it's not wrong to help people, it's not wrong to sell something, but some people are just in a lane, and sometimes we come into their lane, and they didn't ask us to come into their lane, and they didn't say, like, hey, you're a Christian, I would, I would like some help. We just kind of come into their lane, and they are highly annoyed. Have you ever been the recipient of that or the giver of something like that? Because I have many, many times. And so there's even times as a pastor where I feel like I'm having to like sell, like sell the tenets of Christianity to Christians. I don't even understand that. But it feels like I'm always talking about how to be a Christian and Christian, Christian. And I think there's a lot of people, Christian or not, who are in a lane and they're like, I don't want to hear it. I just am in my lane and I'm okay where I'm at. And they're certainly not ready to hear, you're a disaster, I'd like to help you. So I want to talk about evangelism today. I don't want to give you a new way. I want to give you the three non-negotiables as it concerns helping people find Jesus. I've got three in the Bible that you can never change. They apply from the moment Jesus died until today. They are not based on the community that you live in, the part of the world that you live in, the language you speak. I do not want to talk about ways to evangelize because those come and go. I want to give you the three non-negotiables. If you want to help people find Jesus, this is the sermon for you. So we're in Luke chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho, this is Jesus, and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So Zacchaeus, we don't need to, we know, you know this story a little bit. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, which meant he was a Jewish man who worked for the Roman government, which made him highly unpopular. It, to be a tax, and I'm guessing to be a tax collector in that day was about equal to being a tax collector today. Okay, if you're there's there's at least two kinds of people who ruin an entire vibe and a party. Tell someone you work for the IRS. I have never heard that go well. Like people are like, oh, that's an awesome job. You're a cool guy. We really like your organization. Or go into a party and say you're a pastor, which is why I never ever ever do that. I will say that I counsel people or I will say something else. But if I say I'm a pastor, people literally go like, just, it's like I pee in the pool and then, and then people move away from me in the pool. It just totally ruins everything. Okay. So he is a tax collector and he's rich. In that day, in order to uh, collect taxes, the Roman government would have told Zacchaeus, here's how much you need to collect. But that didn't include his salary. So in order for him to become rich, it meant that he was really good at extorting people and stealing from people. So he would have gotten the taxes given to the Roman government, but if he collected the exact tax that they said, he wouldn't actually have anything to live on. So for him to become rich means he's really good at extorting people, okay? So that tax system in that day, just as convoluted as our tax system in our day. Only our government can make paying your taxes so difficult that you need to hire someone because 
I'm too dumb to figure it out. So I have to hire someone smart to help me pay my taxes to the government. Zacchaeus would have been that middleman who went to you and said, hey, you owe some taxes, and you say how much, and he's just making up numbers. Like, oh, you owe like uh, $50 this month. You didn't, and he's just keeping the rest of it. So this man would have been highly unpopular with his people, verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Whatever his size, we aren't given. He's, we don't say, it does say he's like 4'9". We just know he's small in stature, so compared to the average Jewish male in that day, he's smaller than that person. I don't know. But I'll tell you what the small in stature thing is, uh, a, is less of a deal than the he's a rich man climbing up into tree thing. I don't know how many rich people you know. I have met plenty of rich people. Let me tell you what you almost never see. You almost never see a rich person who loves Jesus, is super humble, very loving, and very giving. In fact, every stat you'll ever read says that the greater the income, the less someone actually gives to charitable organizations. It's typically much poorer people who give to others, help others, and give to charitable organizations. The Bible doesn't say that having money is wrong. Having money is great. It's just money. What the Bible says is that if money has your heart, that's a bad thing. You can have money, but money can't have your heart. Those are two very distinct things. And so here we see a rich man who would have had some social status. I mean, I imagine him with a monocle and a top hat. And he's just a little guy, and he's just strutting, and he's rich, and you don't see those guys climb up trees. They just don't. That's a humbling, like, any adults in this room climb a tree recently? Not, I'm not climbing any trees. I'll fall out of the tree and break my hip, which will destroy my life. Like, I'm not, here he is. He's a little man who's rich, I could see this parable going this way. And he paid another man to go climb the tree and, and observe who Jesus was. And then by night, he went and... But he just climbed... It's a super... It's a very humbling thing right here what, that's going on, which I think shows you Zacchaeus' heart, which is beautiful, which is, I need Jesus. I just, I just need him. I don't even know why. I'm not even sure everything this man can do, but I just need him, and I heard about him, and I want to figure this out. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. So somehow Zacchaeus, uh, or Jesus knows Zacchaeus' name. We, we don't know how. It might be that Jesus knew Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus would have been kind of an infamous person. Um, it might be that Jesus is God, and so if he wants to know Zacchaeus' name and the Father, that's in the Father's will, then Jesus could have known Zacchaeus. So I don't know. This could be a miracle that you're seeing. In other words, Zacchaeus is up there, and Jesus looks at him. Okay, so Zacchaeus, it says that Zacchaeus doesn't know who Jesus is, right? So they haven't met. They don't chill. They're not buddies. And it's Jesus who noticed Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus. That's a very powerful moment. And he says, come down, and, and Zacchaeus receives him joyfully. Verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. These are the religious types. Even the regular Jews would have grumbled at this one. Because Zacchaeus is a bad, bad guy. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. 
And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So Zacchaeus gets saved. I love this. Um, when, when Jesus' says repentance has come, he says it after Zacchaeus, um, or salvation has come. Zacchaeus kind of comes up with his own repentance plan, right? So repentance generally is sort of worthless without a repentance plan. So it doesn't mean a whole lot to run into someone's car. I run into Israel's car and I say, I'm really sorry about that. Good luck with that. That's one thing. It's another thing to say, I'm really sorry about that. And I've contacted my insurance. I'm going to make sure that that's paid for. That's a plan. That's called a repentance plan. Zacchaeus doesn't just go, hey, Jesus, super star- sorry about extorting people. That's straight on me. Won't do it anymore. I'll just kind of stop now, but I can't really kind of have my riches. And I kind of need that to survive. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold on to that. And my bad on the past, but moving forward, I'm going to be a really good man. No, he says, I clearly wronged somebody. I repent of my sin, and I'm putting together a repentance plan. How often do we see that in today's world? I rarely hear an I'm sorry. You know what? I, I, I rarely... I've said this before. If someone says they're sorry and they repent and they put together a repentance plan, you're talking about like one out of 100,000 people. You're just, you're just not going to see it. Most of the time, whether it's in counseling or talking to people or whatever, uh, what you'll hear is, hey, hey, Israel, I'm sorry for hitting your car, but you were parked in the wrong spot. That's most of the I'm sorry's that you'll hear. I'm sorry... But, I'm sorry, but your car was a pile of garbage anyways. I probably did you a favor. And you just move on. You guys, if you hear, and, and I'm sorry, I repent, and here's my repentance plan. In that moment, you're experiencing something bib- like of biblical proportion. There's weight in that. Please take it seriously. That's a moment where you can move towards someone and say, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. You just don't get that a lot. Jesus liked to become very unpopular with religious types, and he did that by eating with people. So in today's world, you eat with someone, it means nothing. Literally nothing. In Jesus' day, you eat with someone, and it meant <clears throat> we're, we're getting along. We like each other. We want to support one another. So when Jesus eats with sinners, it's highly offensive to the religious types and to the Jews in general. But verse 10 is, is key. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The entire New Testament of Jesus' life is Lost people being found. Lost, found. Lost without Christ, found by Christ. That's the story of Jesus. A verse like that would be like uh, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Which begs the question, saved from what? Saved from a lack of knowledge? Saved from a life that wouldn't have any meaning into a life that has meaning? Saved from uh, 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 poverty into a more socially just system? Saved from what? And at its core, what the Bible says over and over and over is, from the beginning of the Old Testament to the time of Jesus, 
saved from sin. Matthew 4.17, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent from what? Your sin. Luke 5.32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 15.7, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. Acts 2.38, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 3.19, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Romans 2.4, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly grief produces a repentance, and that repentance leads to salvation. There is no salvation apart from the repentance of sin. You don't have it. It is what separates people who know Jesus from people who do not know Jesus. You must have repentance of sin. And if the best you can squeak out in your life today is, I'm sorry, but and that's how you treat people, then I have to imagine that you and God have not solved your repentance of sin problem. Is that fair? I think that's fair. If I can't go before a holy God and say, I repent of my sin, and then show that to others that I've repented of my sin, I think there's a problem. There's got to be a disconnect on some level. I can't treat you, yeah, but, and think that I've been fully forgiven of my sins with a, with a pure repentance. So we repent of our sin because Jesus came to save us from our sin. After we repent, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Repentance and then coming to Christ. That equals salvation. So when we talk about evangelism, all we're saying is the good news of Jesus, the gospel, uh, telling people about Jesus, telling people who need Jesus, how they should repent, and how they can come to Christ. That process. Now, evangelism can be done in lots of different ways. I am not here tonight to discuss those ways. What I'm here to discuss is the three non-negotiables of evangelism. But let me talk through this real quick. Uh, In the past, there's been evangelism styles like door-to-door evangelism. Whatever happened to -to door-to-door evangelism? Why aren't Christians going around? Hi, ma'am. It's 6 p.m. on a Friday night. I'd like to take up your valuable time and talk to you about Jesus. People used to do this. This used to be a thing. By the way, door to door, I, I, have, I know people who are alive right now who used to sell Bibles door to door. They used to sell these things called encyclopedias door to door, too. Imagine being so ignorant, me as a 10 year old, your only source of knowledge was an encyclopedia set on a shelf, and you were lucky if you had that. And now today you can Google and learn all kinds of false facts. <laughs> At least an encyclopedia had some real facts in it. Now people Google and go, well, I'm a, pro- I'm a professional on that subject now. I can move on. No, you're a, you're a moron, is what you are. Door-to-door evangelism. So what happened? The cults took it. Number one, it was being phased out anyways. Number two, the cults took it. So people knock on your door. It's either Jehovah's Witnesses there to lie to you and lead you down a false path, or the Mormons who lie to you. Let me go on record. The Mormons who are lying to you and leading you down a false path because they do not believe in the Jesus Christ of the Bible. They are lying to you. They believe a false gospel. The other day, I had her knock at my door. I never answer my door. That's why you buy ring. You get ring, people. This this does all kinds of stuff. This shields you from people. So someone knocks on my door. I happen to be there alone. It was in the end. They're like, I'm bored. 
Let's just see. Let's just throw the dice tonight and see who's at the front door. So I open the door, and it's the pest spray man. And I go, hey, how you doing? He goes, good. Uh, I'm here to uh, talk to you about pest spray. And I go, well, uh, we already got a pest spray dude, and he comes twice a year. And uh, yeah, it seems he sprays, and the buds fall out of my house. And instead, and I thought at that point, he goes, cool, thanks, man. Have a good night, and walks away. He asks a question. And the question is, may I ask who you use? And I said, I'm the man of this house. Do you think I know anything? <laughs> what do you think I know? I come in, I eat. I go, my wife handles, she, I don't know. She calls a guy, pays a bill. I saw the dude once. I'm the man of the house. I know nothing. And he smiles and he goes, okay, well, what kind of spray does he use? Again. <laughs> you got me. Dude, I got a job. I don't know what kind of spray. Poison? A poisonous spray is the kind that he's using. And then he asks another question. And I go, have a good night, close the door. And every time I turn around from that door and go, what am I doing? Why am I answering a door ever? Why am I ever answering a door? Why would anybody ever answer a door? The only people I care about text me and say, I'm coming over. Cool, I'll answer the door for you. Otherwise, I'm about to get a very large dog that just like I have to hold back. It's ridiculous. So I think it happened with the Colts door to door, back to door to door evangelism, happened with the Colts, and then I think it happened with this idea that when I'm home, I don't want anybody anymore. There's a, a, a very much, a, especially on the West Coast, we're especially private, fenced, garage door close, close, close. I'm safe now, I think. I believe there's still parts of America where it's a little bit more accepted to do that. I don't think it's on the West Coast. Uh, people used to give gospel tracts. Listen, I come from, a when I was a kid and you went trick-or-treating, I promise you, you came back, dumped your bag out, and you had at least one gospel tract in your Halloween bag. And you knew, and you knew the house that did it, and you were going to go egg that house <laughs> that night. That house was going to get it. I remember going up saying, trick or treat. I was raised a Christian. My father was always an elder of the church. We were like bastions of the church. This lady gives us a 10-minute lecture on how Halloween is the, of the devil and gives us a penny. And I straight up this, I marked your house, lady. <laughs> don't, think, don't think there's not paybacks on this one. There will be paybacks. And it'll be a whole bunch of eggs. Thank you for your gospel lecture. I'm already saved. So gospel tracts, you know, you pick them up, you look at God can use it. God can use anything he wants to use. Uh, big tent revivals. I'm reading the story of Billy Graham. He used to go into cities and set up tents and fill them for like 30 nights in a row. Tens of thousands of people who would come and listen to him talk about Jesus. Guys, it's just not, you don't hear about that very much anymore. Every now and again. We came up with friendship evangelism then. And friendship evangelism was a way to find a fake friend, pretend like you were their friend, and then just run them over with the gospel. I mean, just absolutely sideswipe them. Chill, hang out, act cool, have a beer. Yep, we're friends, and then look for it, and just bam. And across the board, people are like, were you actually my friend, or were you just using friendship evangelism on me? They didn't know the word, and they said it in very unkind ways. Uh, street evangelism. This is a thing. Of all of these that I've said, I haven't, I haven't had a gospel tract in years, haven't had door-to-door -door except by the cults in years, 
Haven't really seen any big tent revivals. But when you go to Sacramento, if you go to Sacramento on, the, on a weekend, to the, they've got like a fake Virginia City. Old Sac. Yeah, it's, it's fake Virginia City is what it is. And if you're from Sacramento, you heard me. Virginia City is the real. They got like, 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 like great value. I'll call it great value Virginia City. <laughs> right near the river. And there was a street preacher there. And he, he had a mic, he had a microphone, and this guy was getting after it. And I sat there and listened. I, what he was saying was true. It really was. He was passionate. He wasn't trying to be mean. What he was saying was true. But it was very like, like a fight was always about to start. It, just, it was just like contentious. So what do we do? It's like we've run out of schemes, guys. So I wanted to give you the three things that you're commanded to do. I'm going to give you the three non-negotiables now. Non-negotiable number one. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. Point number one. The Holy Spirit empowers you to be a witness for Jesus. Bottom line. You didn't just receive the Holy Spirit so that you could overcome all obstacles and do everything. Um, what's the, uh, I saw a guy weightlifting the other day who had Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That doesn't mean like lift more, okay? It just doesn't. You can't do all things. You just can't. That's not what the verse means. It kills me every time. You didn't just receive the Holy Spirit so that you could, like, overcome your obstacles. You receive the Holy Spirit for many reasons, one of which is empowering you for your day, sealing your salvation. But one of the reasons you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit is for you to be a witness for Jesus. He empowers you to be bold. He empowers you to also be sensitive to, to get these, these like leanings from the Holy Spirit on where he might be working, you do. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus. That's a fact. It's been true since the coming of the Holy Spirit. When you repent of your sin, when you trust in Christ as your Savior, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness. You need to rely more on the Holy Spirit. Number one. Number two. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. It is not a, resu a result of work so that no one can boast. Point number two. Every person who comes to Jesus does so by supernatural means. It's always been true. We, listen, here's, we're so great as Americans. We really are. Um, we figure out how to make a stand. So we figure out how to make a stand, and we, we make one, and then we engineer it so that we can make them uh, uh, really fast. And then we engineer it down so that we can make them really cheap. And then we figure out how to sell them. We're really good at that. And I fear, at my core, that I take the gospel and I put it through an American mindset. And I try to figure it out, how I can like mass produce it and sell it through a scheme. And I strip the supernatural right out of the whole thing. Because there's, no there's no supernatural in this stand. It's not. It's a stamped piece of metal that gets put together. And then we cost it down and we sell it. I fear that that's what we do as Americans with, with this. And I think it's really important, point number two, that we realize that it is a miracle of God every single time someone's saved. That God is like doing this work that we, it's just like, if at the end of every, if at the end of every salvation, I can go, that was awesome. I manufactured this, and then I did this, and I slid the gospel in here, 
and then I knocked him over by the power of the Holy Spirit through evangelism, and now this dude's saved. I can walk and go, okay, now I can mass produce that. But if I go, I don't know, I just, God, I was, I was just talking to him, and God just saved this guy. I don't even know, I, I don't know how he did it. God just supernaturally worked in this person's life. That's like holy other. So number one, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Number two, it's a supernatural work of God. And number three, God opens doors through prayer. Colossians 4, 2 to 6, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ in Ephesians 3, 6 is what? The gospel. You have Paul here. Paul is asking other Christians to pray for him so that God will open a door so that he can proclaim the gospel. Last time I checked, Peter and Paul could actually heal people. Last time I checked, Paul could get bit by a serpent and then be fine, and people are like, that seems like a good God. Can I serve him? I don't have that. Paul asks for people to pray. I'm saying this, I worry this. Am I so, in the people who I want them to know Jesus, am I so concerned about the style that I'm going to tell them about Jesus that I forget praying, just praying for them that they find Jesus? Number one, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Number two, it's a supernatural work of God. You can't do anything about those. That's God's job. And number three, though, you can pray. I'll close with this. <clears throat> I had a good friend growing up, junior high, high school, still friends, friends today. And my freshman year, I started praying for him. That Our, our youth pastor said, you need to pray for people. All right, well, I'm going to pray for him. I prayed for him every single day. And after three years, nothing happened. Some of you have been praying for a family member or something every day, and you err. Nothing happens at all. So I'm praying, praying, praying. No conversation ever comes up. I, you know, it would be different if I was walking on the treadmill and I turned and said, hey, you look like a super ripped dude. How about we talk about what you can do for me? Right? But I kept feeling like I'm the one badgering people for like, hey, over there, your life looks miserable. I can help you. I'm like, that doesn't go very far. So I prayed every day. I prayed multiple times every day. Every day. I had it written on my desk. For freshman, sophomore, junior year, I never, God is my witness, I never missed a day that I didn't pray for my friend. I never missed a day. Phone rings one day. Not a cell phone, a wall phone with a cord, and we had a short cord, because only rich kids could afford a long cord, where you like went down the hallway and you had some privacy. So you used to just stand like three feet, I know this is hard to believe, but you used to stand next to a wall and just like talk to people. You couldn't wander around, you couldn't go to the bathroom, you couldn't like do other chores and half listen to them. You were just sitting there next to a wall holding a phone. And he calls me and says, uh, uh, my life is miserable. I, something's wrong. And you seem to be doing good. I need you to tell me how, how is that possible. You kidding me? You're telling me that's not a supernatural work of God? I never had a conversation. I didn't do anything. Yep, let's talk. So I lead him to Christ on the phone, I, if I remember right, either on the phone or in the car, and then we go to youth group that night, and he literally never turns around, just, I mean, never turns back to the world. He just, like, from that day, a full-blown Christian never turned back again, lived his life as a Christian, led other people to the Lord, has a Christian family. I'm like, how? I don't even understand how that works. All I did was pray. I only did one thing. Everybody in this room, if I told everybody in this room, your job this week 
is to find some sucker on a treadmill and just blast him with the, just the gospel. Just get, bring a microphone, a speaker, and just get after it. Everybody in this room would go, mm, no. But I know this about everybody in this room. If someone came to you and said, I don't know what's going on, and I have some questions about Jesus, would you be willing to talk to me? I, I, I honestly believe that everybody in this room would be like, yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. I would absolutely talk to you. Evangelism in that realm is pure joy. Evangelism in the beat people up is pure misery. I'm asking this church to start doing this. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural work of God. I'm asking you to start praying. If you attend Mountainside, I want you to own, you should own two books. You should own more, but you should own two books. One is a Bible, and the next is some kind of a prayer journal with a bunch of names. I do journal. I always forget that this is your second book. I'm super bad about that. I waste so much money. Dave's like, oh, yeah, I, uh, I emailed it all to you. It's on a spreadsheet. I'm like, uh, how about printing it? I just need it on a piece of paper. There's your Bible and the people you're praying for. There is absolutely no reason why everybody in this room can't spend five minutes a day praying for a whole bunch of people who radically need Jesus. There's, there's, no, reason we, we, there's no reason why we can do it. Now, if I had a brand new track, and I, and I said, oh, I've written a track, and I, what I did was I drew it up, and it looks like a $100 bill, so people are going to grab it. <laughs> and it's super tricky, and you leave it, you leave it on a toilet, and then, and then they grab it, and they're like, it's not a $100 bill. It's better than that. It's the gospel. And I'm going to repent of my sin right now in this stall. You'd be like, no, I'm out. What I'm asking you to do is start a list of names of people who need Jesus. And I'm asking you to not miss a day. I mean this. You don't miss a day. Put on your steering wheel. Put in your bathroom. I don't know. I don't know what you need to do. That's my problem with this. I have a whole bunch of notes in here I never look at because I don't know where they're at. They're in the computer somewhere. <laughs> and if you get that reference, I'll give you a candy bar later. They're in there. So I don't see them. But if I put it on my steering wheel with a piece of duct tape, guess what? I'm praying. I don't care what you need to do. I'm asking you, please, get a list and pray. Ask Paul. Paul said, I need you guys to pray that God opens a door. If Paul needed that prayer, then I need it. But that's a non-negotiable. It's the way God works. He works through prayer. I'm begging you, let's all start praying. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for each and every person who's here. Father, I love them. Most importantly, Christ loves them. We would love to share Jesus with somebody. We realize our own ineptness, our own fleshliness, our own material just lacking in so many ways. We need you, Father. But we're going to commit to start praying for our friends, our family, and others who need Jesus. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.